Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. On this day leading up to Reformation Sunday, where we are uh, celebrating and, and focusing on how God forms the church, how God reforms us, and how God transforms us. So today, we will be talking about being reformed in Christ. A special welcome to any guests that we have with us this morning. It is good to have you with us. We hope and pray that you will contact us afterwards and, or leave us your information. We'd love to get to know you better. Our conviction that God makes us all unique and valuable, again, means that we welcome you. We welcome you to bring your whole self with your own perspectives, abilities, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and cultural background to this community where all belong and have a purpose. At Emmanuel Lutheran Church, we are a community through whom God is transforming, transforming lives by sharing our faith in God's love and grace. Again, welcome. Let us take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Amen. Amen. Let us together confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved children of God, God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his very own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Our gathering hymn is Jesus Loves Me, ELW 595.
Let us pray. Sovereign God, open our hearts to the truth that all of creation belongs to you and is loved by you. Inspire in us a commitment to this truth that would lead to caring for the earth, sharing resources, and striving for peace and justice. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Reading today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Paul, Savonis, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of per persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acacia. For the word of the Lord was sounded forth from you, not only in the Macedonia and Acadia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For people of those regions report about us, what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve in a living and true God and wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. children and young at heart to come forward and uh, and to engage with our children's chat as we read a book. This, uh, this season leading up to October 31st is in the church. Uh, October 31st is Reformation Sunday. And so in our church, we like to focus on how we are being formed in Christ and reformed in Christ and then transformed in Christ. So last week we talked about being formed, being made in Christ. This week we're going to be talking about being reformed. So even though this is not Reformation Sunday, I wanted to read you a book about Martin Luther, who a man who changed the world, or as we can say, reformed the church in a time of need. Martin Luther was born at Eisleben in Germany in 1483, over 500 years ago. Martin Luther loved uh, the Bible and was born to a man named Hans Luther and a mother named Margarita. Uh, Hans Luther was a fairly wealthy miner and so he wanted his son to make good in the world. And so he sent his son to the University of Erfurt to study law. Martin, he wanted to become a, a lawyer and, um, and to become an important person in society. But Martin Luther himself wanted to do something a little bit different. And one day, on his way, let me get a little closer here. There we go. One day, on his way between school and uh, home, Martin Luther got caught in the middle of a thunderstorm. And the thunderstorm uh, shook around him. The lightning came down around him. And the tree in the middle of the field 
was, um, was at risk of being hit by lightning, and so was Luther. And he became so frightened that he put, he got down on his knees and he prayed to Saint Anne, saying, Saint Anne, save me, I will become a monk. And so that's exactly what he did. He left law and the university and became a monk in the, um, in the Augustinian order, the strictest order of them all. Martin didn't wish to flee, displease his father, but he felt called being a monk. And so his dad was not happy with him, but he went and became a monk. And Brother Martin constantly was trying to become a good monk, to be pleasing in God's sight. He always felt like he wasn't good enough. And so he prayed, and he studied, and he confessed his sins one after another. Did it help? Well, not entirely. So finally, the leaders thought, well, let's send him to Rome, to the heart of Christianity at that day, and see uh, what happens then when he visits the headquarters of Christianity. But when he saw how worldly and sinfully the Pope and the Cardinals behaved, his despair and his anguish only deepened. So then, once again, Martin Luther's life was changed. The ruler of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, had established a new university in Wittenberg, and he asked Martin Luther to be a professor there. So he became a professor, and he taught, and he preached to the people. But did he find peace with God? Well, not entirely. The head of uh, the local monastery, his mentor, Johann von Staupitz, led Luther to look into the Bible for answers. And that led him to reading St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And when he read the letter to the Romans, he heard that God's righteousness, God's holiness, is a gift to those who believe in Christ as their Savior. Paul explained that righteousness was not only God's, um, and it wasn't only God's perfection, but it was something that God gave to God's people when they confessed their sins and asked for forgiveness and turned back to Christ. So now Luther understood that he didn't have to earn God's forgiveness and God's love because Christ had already done that had already forgiven him and told him that God loves him, no matter what. So Luther was excited to learn this truth and to tell others about it, but strangely enough, as sometimes happens, the church got in the way. So the church of his time taught that punishment for sin would happen in a place called purgatory, between heaven and hell. And in order to, to get people out of purgatory, you had to buy something called an indulgence, which was basically a slip of paper the church had written on. And Tetzel, a man named Tetzel, was selling these indulgences. And when he came to Wittenberg, let me tell you, Martin Luther was none too happy. So finally, on October 31st, 1517, over 500 years ago, he wrote 95 concerns or theses about purgatory and about indulgences and about other teachings of the church, and he nailed them on the church bulletin board. Well, I was going to say the town bulletin board, and that was the church door. This was an act of reformation that changed the world. Suddenly, other leaders from throughout Europe and the empire um, took notice of Martin Luther because he was causing a stir. And next, he took part in a debate in Leipzig that lasted 18 days. Finally, Pope Leo X actually expelled him from the church. Frederick the Wise, the ruler of Saxony, agreed that the church needed reform, and he protected Luther. Thanks be to God for that. Eventually, Luther appeared before the emperor himself, Charles V, in a city called Worms on the Rhine. The, uh, the emperor told Luther to, um, to recant, to, to, to dismiss all of his writings and his teachings, and this is what Luther said. Bravely and boldly, 
me with courage. He says, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot recant anything, for to go against conscience is e neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me and save me. Amen. Can you imagine the courage that that took? Wow, so much. Finally, Charles V and the other church leaders declared that Luther was an outlaw and people could kill him on sight. So, on his way back home from this meeting, Luther was kidnapped in the middle of the night, fearing for his life. He was taken to a place called uh, Wartburg, an old fortress castle. And lo and behold, it was his friends that had kidnapped him for his own safety. And they put him in the castle. They didn't lock him in there, but he stayed in there. And he decided to do something that he thought was so important. You see, the Bible of the time was only in Latin, and the people couldn't read it. And so he translated the New Testament into German, the language of the people. But he couldn't stay in Wartburg forever. You see, the people that followed with him, the other reformers, were quickly making chaos throughout the towns because sometimes reformation takes a little chaos. They were, monasteries and nunneries were being closed. They were vandalizing religious art and music and stained glass and statues of the saints. And Philip Melanchthon, Luther's friend and colleague, said, I can't control it. But Luther could. Luther came back and he preached from the pulpit. And he explained the teachings and the traditions of the church that were against scripture and needed to be changed. But he also explained the other practices of the church that helped people in worship, liturgy, and music and said that we need to keep those things. So he preached and celebrated the sacraments and proclaimed forgiveness of sin and brought God's word to the people. And he made many inventions and he wrote many books in German that the people could read to learn their faith at home. So now Luther was teaching and preaching and one day uh, several nuns decided to escape their convent and one of them was Katharina von Bora. And Luther uh, connected them with men and found them husbands because that's what you did back then. But Katharina didn't want any of the husbands he found for her. He wa she wanted him. And so Martin and Katie, as he called her, were married in 1525. She was a strong, intelligent woman, and she was outspoken. And they had a happy life together and had six children. And night after night, he invited everybody to come to his table for a table, temple talk, or table talks and talking about God and theology. And, and poor Katie figured out how to feed them all. She was the breadwinner, really, of the family. Um, so, but, you know, Emperor Charles V continued to threaten the Lutheran princes, asking them to uh, turn away from this and to reconcile with the church. But they started. They wrote him a letter saying, "We protest." And they, and then they they coined the term Protestant, which is a name that we still hold on to today in our Protestant churches. Still trying to reconcile, to bring the church back together, the emperor and the Lutheran leaders met again in Oxford in 1530. But this time Luther couldn't go because if he left his area he would have been killed. So his friend, Philip Melanchthon, went and defended the thoughts and the teachings of the Lutherans. But the Pope and the Emperor were not convinced, and so that became the division of the Lutheran Church from the Roman Catholic Church of the time. Um, after the Augsburg, Luther was really busy, and the church spread throughout Germany and Norway and all the way into the Americas here, um, so that we still today uh, use the name Lutherans. So many of the students and visitors stayed at their houses, and he wrote a lot of writings 
But you know, Luther had some difficulties too. He had some health problems. And early in 1546, he went to Eisleben to help solve a quarrel between two princes. He settled the dispute, but the elderly Luther had two heart attacks. Friends gathered around his bed, and one of them asked him, Reverend Father Luther, are you ready to die in the name of Christ? And he said, yes, I'm ready to go home to God. And so he died in Ace Isolated, where his life began. Martin Luther was buried beneath the pulpit of the castle church in Wittenberg, where 30 years earlier, he had posted the 95 Theses that kicked off the Reformation. Beloved children of God, the story of Martin Luther is a story that we recall and remember because it teaches us that as a church, as a nation, and as individuals, we constantly need to be reformed because we stray. We stray from who God calls us to be and how God calls us to live. And so God constantly calls us back to be reformed in Christ. So let us always be reformed in Christ together. Amen. Oh, let us close with a word of prayer. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For the Reformation. For the Reformation. And for always. And for always. Helping us. Helping us. Be our best selves. Be our best selves. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Ready, big finish. Amen. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to receive the gospel. The Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrite? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the thing that are the emperor's, and give to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us open with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Two weeks two weeks before our national elections. And we're inundated with ads, aren't we? Signs everywhere for different political candidates, for different referendums, commercials, on television, on YouTube, on the internet, door hangers that we find as we come home from driving, away, from being gone. Note cards that are sent to us. Often these campaign ads, they're negative. They often try to, uh, try to feed on our fears. They often uh, diminish the other candidate. Sometimes people actually share what they're planning on doing, and it can actually be informative. 
two weeks before our national elections. Can you feel it in the air? People feeling nervous? The country feeling divided? You know, there's many different ways of advertising. I learned this when I spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Ambia, West Africa. You see, I went there in 2001 in an election year. And people didn't have televisions or phones at the time. In fact, in my village of 2,500 people, I think there was one or two televisions that they'd hook up to the generator every once in a blue moon, and the whole town would come out and watch something. So you couldn't do campaign ads that way. But believe me, people campaigned. They used what the people had in their hands and in their lives. The political campaign took place on fabric. The candidates would print their face and their name on fabric and then people would and give it to the people and people would make outfits out of it. So all of a sudden you had people literally wearing their campaign ads. Clever advertising. In Jesus' day too, how are you going to advertise who you give your allegiance to? Even if they didn't have the, vote, the right to vote, they still needed to be convinced that the leaders were the ones in whom they could put their trust. And so what did they do? They minted coins. And the Roman Empire had coins printed. And on that coin was the face of the, the, of the Caesar, the emperor. And, and with that coin was Son of God, the title, Son of God, the Holy One. You see, Augustus was considered a god, and so Octavius was considered the son of God. Does that title sound familiar? But there was a law in the Israelite world, in Jesus' world, that in fact is the Ten Commandments, that says that you shall have no other gods before me, says the Lord. You shall not have idols, and you shall not have graven images. And so people would come to the temple, and in the courts, interestingly enough, Jesus overturned the money changers' tables, but the money changers were doing an important service, actually, because people would take their Roman denarius, and they would exchange them for shekels, out the image on it so that they could um, buy offerings, pure offerings to offer in the temple, um, in, in the more holy part of the temple, the inner sanctums of the temple. And so, as Jesus was teaching, in this inner holier sanctum, you would think that nobody would have a denarius because they should have only shekels at this point, right? And so the leaders try to trap him, and they say, okay, Jesus, should we pay taxes to the emperor? Well, if he said no, what would happen? The empire would come and kill him. If he said yes, what would happen? The crowd who was horribly oppressed by this foreign power would rise up against him and no longer follow him. It was a really good trap. It was a really good trap, but they didn't count on Jesus. Jesus saying, well, okay, give me a coin. And they produced it like that. You see, they still had a denarius on them. He trapped them. But he went further than just trapping them, didn't he? He went further and he said, whose image is this? And they said, oh, the emperor's. And he said, fine, fine, partake in the empire. Give to the emperor what is the emperor's. But let me ask you, but let me tell you this. Give to God what is God's. You see how he turns the tables on them and asks them the question, what is God's? What is God's? It's a question for us as well. 
In fact, the people in Paul's time were still asking that question. 13 to 20 years after Jesus had been crucified, Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians. They were a trade center and a capital of the Roman province of Macedonia, and they honored Julius Caesar as God, and Emperor Octavian as son of God. And so to have a church planted in this area meant that they were in great danger. And this was a church under deep persecution, where people were killed for living out their faith. So Paul, who longs to come to them and is separated from them, wonders if he would find faith if he were able to come. He wants to come and encourage their faith, but he can't get there for some reason right now. But he wonders, will he find faith there? You know, for the first time in my life, I really, really, really feel like I can kind of relate to Paul in this one. I talk to you on the phone, but do I really know how you're doing in your hearts? I long to come to you. I long to encourage your faith. I long to hear how you are doing in your faith. And I long to receive from you encouragement back in my faith, like Paul longed to receive from them. I long to know that indeed your faith is strong. As Paul says, he encourages them to continue in what he found in them already. You see, this faith community of Emmanuel, whether you have been here for years, a couple years, or a few months, or you're joining us online, this faith community of Emmanuel has been formed. And now we we wonder, are we continuing? Where are we continuing? I want to encourage you to continue as Paul encourages them in the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. Faith, love, and hope, doesn't that sound familiar? You see, we are people continually being reformed, and these are tools for our reformation, working out of our faith, working out, living into our allegiance, not to the emperor, but to God. You see the political ads that would say to us, put your trust in me, put your confidence in me, give me your allegiance. Ultimately, those of us who claim the name Christian, we are making a statement to ourselves and to the world that our allegiance is to Christ. That our faith and our trust is in Christ. And that ultimately, we don't put our hope in the ways of the world. And so we work out our faith, we live into our faith. And then we labor for the good of all. How are we laboring for the good of all? How are we caring for the world around us? And lastly, holding steadfastly on to hope. In a world that would tell us that everything is chaos and bad. In a world that would play on our fears and bring out the worst in us. How do we hold on to the hope that tells us that God is always stronger than the world? Indeed, the world was formed by God and is continually being reformed by God and the spirit of God. Christ is at work in this time and in this place. In the chaos of our nation, how are we, how are you, people of Emmanuel Lutheran Church, how are you embodying the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope? We ask this question in our online Bible study this week, and people talked about the little labors. The little labors of, of people who would come in, giving their, their trust and their faith to, to Christ. They would come in, in the middle of um, a pandemic, and carefully remove the pews, knowing that while we don't gather in this sanctuary right now, we will again someday. And so we will, we will reform this sanctuary into a place where people can rest in God's grace together. Working out our faith. How are you working out your faith? One of the ways
ways that I thought that this week is in a conversation with my niece on the phone, which was wonderful. I miss her. She, we were talking about how hard this time is right now. She's 14, and she and her friends feel this hardness as much as all of us. And I said to her, well, do you have a scripture that you walk with during a time like this? And immediately she said, Psalm 91, Auntie A. Psalm 91 is my psalm. So we read it together. We it, and we talked about what image of God gives you comfort and hope. I talked about light. My mom talked about eagle's wings. My niece is contemplating it. She'll get back to me on that one. Don't worry. I gave her homework. I texted her the question so she wouldn't forget. <laughs> Can you imagine having me as an aunt? <laughs> there you go. Working out our faith. How are you leaning into your trust of God? Cultivating it, growing it. When the world tells you to be afraid, lay down your fears at the foot of the cross in prayer. Read scripture that reminds you that God is a God of all. Indeed, the question is, what is God's? Everything is God's. You, beloved child, are God's. This nation even is God's. Let us not, let us not be unaware of that. But then people started, talked about other things. Little labors of love. Like people who, who um, plant trees. Martin Luther was once asked, if the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you do? And he said, I would plant an apple tree. Well, in February, Friends of Trees came and we planted 14 trees on this property. And you know what? Over a hot summer, someone had to water them. And so someone faithfully watered them uh, on a daily basis, making sure they were watered. And someone all else uh, planted potted plants so that the front of the church would look welcoming and inviting, so that when you drive by, you see life in this faith community, because it's still alive. Laborers of love, the care team, calling, all the, the members and participants of the congregation, the outreach that we're doing by collecting school supplies, by opening safe park car camping, by, um, by planning the winter shelter for people who, um, who could be at real risk this winter from cold and disease, not having a place to sleep at night. Working out our labor of love. And lastly, let us not forget steadfastness of hope. How do you hold on to hope? Last night, I voted. Last night I voted and I do not put my, my hope in my vote. But I'll tell you that voting to me was a hope-filled act. I read my scripture. I chose uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 7 through 14. Seek the good of the city in which you live. Know that God has designed for you a future with hope. Do not be afraid. So I rested in that scripture, I read the voters' pamphlet, I prayed about it, and then I voted. I voted, and I, I consulted with the moms, because that's what I do too. I consult with people that I trust. But it felt like an act of hope. You see, if I was hopeless, I wouldn't bother. So I hope that we hold on to our hope and that we don't. But we have to have hope in something that is steadfast. And beloved children of God, that is Christ. So what do you witness? When we ask you, when we ask you, what does it mean to give to God what is God's? How do you continue to work out your faith? How do you continue to labor in love? How do you hold on to steadfastness of hope? And how do you share that with one another, with your children, your grandparents, your family members, strangers on the street? In sharing our faith, we believe that God continues to reform the lives of individuals, of our faith community, our church, and of our nation and our world, day after day, moment. And so, beloved child of God, 
may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, continue to reform you in the love and grace and justice and peace of Christ now and always. Amen. Our hymn of response is Grace Alone. in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among the priesthood of all believers 
that we might work to build up your, your reign of justice, peace, and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. We especially pray for the United States and our upcoming elections that we might live into our values of liberty and justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt, especially those on my prayer list. We pray for Brian and for Lori. Thanksgiving for the healing of Doug. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. God of truth, you show no partiality. May your spirit guide the work of justices, magistrates, court officials, and all vocations of the law that your promise of restoration may be known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and ever living God. You formed the earth from chaos and encircled the globe with air. You created fire for warmth and light and nourished the lands with water. You molded us in your image and with mercy higher than the mountains, and grace deeper than the seas, you claim us as your own, and reform us daily to live in your spirit. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and with this cup, we remember your Son, O Lord, the firstborn of your new creation. We remember his life lived for others, his death and resurrection, which renews the face of the earth. And we await his coming, when with the world made perfect through your wisdom, all our sins and sorrows will be no more. Holy and gracious God, receive our praise and our prayers just as Christ receives the cries of those in need. And fill us with your blessing, until needing no longer and bound to you in love, we feast forever in the triumph of the, of the Lamb, through whom all glory and honor is yours, O living one, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We are bold this morning to pray that risky prayer that Christ first taught us. That prayer for God's kingdom and God's will to be done, not ours. That prayer for us to learn to give and receive forgiveness and
and that prayer for all to have enough. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Beloved children of God, we recognize that ideally in communion we would be communing together in person. But we also recognize the Spirit of Christ comes upon us and unites us as one body of Christ wherever we are. So if you so choose, we invite you to set your own altar table and to join us for communion. Receiving the bread of life. This is the body of Christ given for you. Receiving the cup of grace. This is the blood of Christ given. For you. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Our sending hymn today is All Who Hunger Gather Gladly, ELW number 461.
Beloved children of God, receive God's blessing. Mothering God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life, now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love the Lord and walk alongside those in need of support. Thanks be to God. A brief time of announcements for those who would like to, to stay and, and receive them. First of all, thank you again for those who have joined us, especially our first-time visitors. We hope to hear from you so that we can get to know you better. Also, there's a couple of announcements. Again, after, uh, after church today, we have fellowship time online on our Zoom account, so let me know if you don't have those codes. And then uh, Monday, we have book study. Uh, we're doing, I think, chapters 15 and 16 uh, of our How to Be an Anti-Racist book at 12.30 online. And then Tuesday, Bible study. All are welcome to join us. We look at the scriptures for the following Sunday. So it's a great preparation time. It's online at uh, 6.30 p.m. Um, on, on Tuesdays. Um, a couple of things coming up. First of all, we are putting together a little Halloween festivities, hopefully outside, for our, our kiddos, our church kids and our safe haven kids. And so, uh, so if you would like to volunteer to prepare anything ahead of time, we probably won't have a lot of volunteers here the day of, but if you'd like to help with any ways or have any games or um, any decorations that you'd like to do, um, to lend us for that time, um, let me know, and that would be great. And if you want to be part of the planning team, let me know. Uh, we're meeting this week. That's going to be actually on Halloween at 10 to, to noon, and families are signing up for that. So if you'd like to sign up for a time slot, let me know, um, If especially those with kiddos. We're kind of targeting the kiddos here for this. Um, in all, our welcome to uh, to send to us something for um, All Saints Sunday. All Saints Sunday to the, this year on November 1st is actually on All Saints Day, which I just think is so cool. So what we want to do is we want to get some things together ahead of time. So in the next week, if you would please think about someone that taught you about what... Uh, about how to live your life. Something, someone who taught you something about how you want to live your life or how you want to live your faith. You know, I when I think of somebody who has died before me, who taught me about my faith, I know you know who I'm going to say. But my mentor, Jim Stender, um, pastor over at, uh, at St. Andrew for many years, and my mentor and friend and father figure, um, I think of him, and so I, but I get to talk about him all the time. So what we wanted to do was ask you that question. Think of somebody that you are thinking about who's passed, and what did, what, is, what did they teach you about life or about faith that you carry with you? And if you would record yourself saying that for a minute, 30 seconds, two minutes, something under two minutes, um, if you'd send us in the recording, or we can help you with it, uh, we would really love to put that in the service on All Saints Sunday. Also, if there's somebody close to you who has passed this last year, please email us um, or call us with those names because we want to make sure that we don't forget anybody. All right? Um, I don't know what you're saying. Picture. Maybe a oh, picture. Oh, and please, along with those video recordings of somebody or um, just thoughts of people that you've lost, send in a picture because we'll have a slideshow of pictures as well. So if you think you might want to remember somebody in some way and send us a video or a picture, send it in and we'll see what we can do with it. Um, any other, also on that Sunday, you're going to have, want to have a candle available for worship too. Any other announcements, Tuff? Wednesday night, book, all church-wide book study? You yeah, we do have the church-wide, no, no church-wide book study this, well, it's not a big group. Because particularly Dave and, and Betty Joe are headed down south. So.
So we, we bless them on their trip then. Okay, um, with no further announcements, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peppy and Meredith, for your service. Um, for, I think it was Sheila and, and um, Donna on 